Okay, so welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, so it's with myself, Andrew for, from Airs Health, and we've got um, Ian Sadler joining us today as well. And we're going to be discussing foot orthosis. We're going to discuss a few things about them, we're going to, uh, what they do, what they are, and whether they should be used as a long-term or short-term treatment, and how they how they work as well. So hopefully. We're going to be able to get through all of that in the in the next hour. As normal, if you have any questions, then pop them in the the comments section below, and I'll do my best to keep my eye on on the comments that come through, and we'll try and try and answer questions as we go. And if you're watching on YouTube, then make sure you press the subscribe button because that's where that's where the magic's at. All right. So uh, before we get started, I'll let Ian introduce himself because uh, I'm sure everybody that watch it follows airs health will probably know know who i am so yeah yes, so, we'll to that, so. so uh hi i'm ian sadler i'm uh, like uh, like andrew podiatrist by undergraduate profession um and we so basically i run a specialist gait analysis biomechanics uh, sort of clinic where we um try and work out what's going on with you and we probably to for the context of this uh, orthotics are one of the one of the treatments that we use and for the number of patients who come in we probably prescribe about 40 to 60 percent of our patients an orthotic of some type some of those are permanent some of those are temporary and we'll, we'll walk, talk walk and talk around uh, some of the decision making we might make for that uh, for my background I've worked as uh, I've provided lectures for a lot of the sort of national UK based orthotics companies and I've done a little bit of consulting for a couple of well one of the trainer companies um, and I've worked for the within the industry for the gait analysis technology so foot pressure and tying it up with uh, video analysis and all those sorts of things so uh, building insoles from various different routes and uh, helping people when they they come a bit unstuck with their insoles as well. Brilliant okay so uh yeah, what was percentage do you say you? Uh, I'd probably say about forty to sixty percent of the people have an insole. We just did a, an audit of our of our notes, and it's actually less than I intuitively thought. We're okay. getting we're getting insoles, and uh, yeah, quite a few are for a short term uh, period while while they're getting over things. But equally, quite a lot of them, it's going to be something they're going to need help with for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I think that ties in quite. Quite well with um, with our use as well. But, yeah, probably about forty percent have insoles um, of, of different types because we've got the the off the shelf ones, the semi customs, and the and the actual the fully custom made ones as well. we'll define that. So, with for a bit of a discussion about what insoles actually are. So, yeah. I think people have a, a vague idea. We've got a, a pile of them here to to look at. So. People classically think of this sort of thing as, a, as an orthotic and insole, but we've got lots of different types and shapes and sizes. So essentially a bent bit of plastic of some description that you're sticking in your shoe uh, in the hope that it's going to help. So um, what's the difference between that and the uh, shoe insole that comes with the shoe anyway uh, and those sorts of things. So I actually recently went to a conference there was an American chap who called the insole from the shoe a sock liner rather than an insole and I think I didn't like it at first but I think I prefer that because it makes us think that it's a temporary thing that needs to be changed every so often because it's just you know a bit of cushioning that's soaking up some of the sweat from your running feet um, and the difference of an insole which is essentially something we're trying to affect a change with so if uh, you're happy Andrew I'm just going to share the screen now if that yeah, 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 that's yeah, work yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we can then hopefully run through a little bit of a presentation so i put together a couple of slides because there's some definitions we need to think about with insoles or i i prefer to call them orthotic insoles rather than orthotics or insoles so for us to start with i don't think they're very well named so orthotic implies a splint so when you apply an orthotic to another part of the body the aim is to to hold it still or splint it so uh, whereas an insole is something that goes inside your shoe so um, we're th talking about foot orthoses or orthotic uh, insoles as I prefer to call them I have another name I like for them later but we'll come to that as we go so we've basically got two broadly types of insole so we've got 
sh what are termed professionally shank dependent or realistically shoe dependent insoles. So those are insoles which require the stiffness or the upper of the shoe to hold them up. So you've got a, an insole like this, which looks like it's got quite a lot of shape, but it's ba basically just a soft bit of rubber. All right. So that requires the shoe to stiffen it against the side. So we've got insoles like that. And then we have shank independent or insoles which are independent of the shoe. So we've got one, I'll just grab one here. So something which has its own sort of standalone shape, which doesn't require the actual shoe to help prop it up. So some insoles, it's really important that you put them in shoes which are um, strong enough to support the function of the insole. There's some insoles, some orthotic insoles are standalone devices. So sort of, I like to think of them as an independent environment that you can put inside whichever shoe um, you're going to wear. All right. So broadly, they're the two types of insole. And then you, you've got lots of different formats that those two insoles can be. So first of all, we've got off the shelf insoles. So those are the sorts of things as we've seen there, the super feet and the ones you can buy from boots, other pharmacists are available. Um, and we've got a lot of what I term medical grade um, uh, or off the shelf insoles. So certainly in the last sort of five or 10 years, a lot of insole prescription is now possible from a pre-made insole. So if you've got symmetrical problems, left and right are broadly similar in terms of the problems. Um, and it's only one or two types of issue that we're trying to address with an orthotic and off the shelf might be quite a useful um, solution for that. We've then got semi bespoke or modular. So these are essentially pre-made components which are being stuck together to, cr to create you an insult. So it is bespokely made for you, but it's made from constituent or con component parts which have been pre-made. So it's a bit like a Meccano set that we're sticking together to, to make that for you. And then we've got fully bespoke or custom devices. So these are usually created from a scan or a cast of some description. Uh, I just, uh, for this uh, here, I just ripped a, uh, an image off the internet, but there's lots, several different casting methods, several different scanning methods, lots of different software to make the scan. Um, and probably one of the main things we'd be looking for there is if your foot had something sticky out to your lumpy, which isn't going to be that comfortable on one of the bespoke, uh, sorry, the pre-made types of things. Um, or if there's a particular thing that we're trying to achieve, maybe if it's not symmetrical. So if the left foot requires something different to the right foot, then we've got to make you that insole possibly. Okay, so they're the sort of devices that we're going to make. Yeah, I think that's something to just to clarify because a lot of people come into the our clinic and if if we're making this a bespoke insole for them then there's quite a few different ways of uh, getting a cast of the foot some people can use like a, a 3d scanner which we've got the, the image of there um, and then other people use foam boxes or, or plaster casts i think a lot of, a lot of our a lot of patients get confused about the type of thing that they've had done for them. If they're talking to somebody that's been to a different clinic and they've been through a different process, then quite often they can get uh, get a bit, bit worried that they're, they're not actually getting the, the custom insult they have. Yeah, the, the full package. It, yeah, yeah, they yeah. have their, their foot casted in the same way. So, so are, the, yeah. the, se the semi-bespoke ones, you can, you can have those vacuum formed around your foot, for example, so that pre- part if you like that's being vacuum formed around you and then they would stick stick or or grind elements into those yeah. um whereas yeah there's and well, i was counting up there's a, there's a six or seven different theories behind how you might construct an insole to make it a custom or bespoke and each of those might require a different type of casting or a different type of scan and then the software that makes them is again uh, there's various different versions of how those softwares run so um when you get to that bespoke or custom, that's a, you know, it, I'd probably take me a, a half a day or a day to go through all the different types and variants and why you might, your decision-making process for those. So um, they're, they're basically the, the, the broadly the ways and there's, there's not a right or a wrong way of doing it, which we'll, we'll come across later. So first of all, lots of myths around insoles, lots of, uh, lots of things. So we're going to have a talk about what an orthotic won't do. Yeah, first of all so the, the myth stuff so 
the image that's on there is a very common image that's used. I often call it an image that's used to sell a million insoles. Um, and I'm not picking on Vionic shoes. Hundreds of companies use these types of things. It's just I happen to use their, their one. So you'll see the dotted line marks down the back of the, back of the heel there um, along here. And then there's a curved one without the insole. All right. So our aim is not to make this line straight. Okay. It never has been. It never will be. I don't think it might change. But so far, our aim is to not make this straight. Okay. The rolling outwards of your heel and the relative rolling inwards of your ankle needs to happen to a set to, for most people in some form of step. All right, so we need to see movement or change of that. Okay, and as we're going to have a look at in a minute, the foot's a dynamic moving thing. So we don't want to hold it in a single place, right? And there's not much evidence that we can anyway, uh, even if we wanted to. All right, so the next one or the word that we probably most commonly get used is an arch support. Okay, so an orthotic insole, certainly the prescription ones, we, we said I wouldn't be defining those an arch support. So as we'll have a look at in a moment, the arch is, a, is an emerging property from the way the foot functions. It's not something we want to prop up or, st or, or just hold off the ground. So we're not looking to hold the foot into a, a, a neutral position, all right? So the foot has to go through a series of movements to get across the ground, and we're not trying to hold it in any one of those positions. You will perhaps when you're having the insole either casted or during the examination to decide which insole, your foot might be held in particular positions as reference points so that you can see one bone relative to another relative to another. So we need these sorts of reference points for that, but that it's not the aim of the insole to sort of keep you there. All right. So this is why I don't like the word orthotic because the, uh, an insole is not going to splint your foot. If it did, you would not wear it. If an insole literally held your foot rigidly still and then you had to move your body over the top or adapt to the ground underneath it, you just wouldn't wear it. All right. So if we could create an insole, which is a splint, it would have to come above the ankle joint and wrap around most of the foot to actually hold it still. So whatever we do, your foot is going to move on or with that insole. OK, so an insole does not weaken the foot. This is an interesting suspension of logic. So your tissues adapt to the job you ask them to do. So when you wear an insole, your muscles will, or your soft tissues, ligaments, tendons, muscles should adapt to the function that that structure is making it do. If you repeat it enough times, you'll just form different um, muscle structures around that. So you'll probably find that it will definitely weaken one bit, but strengthen another. But then you have to ask why you're wearing the insole in the first place. And if why you're wearing the insole was a bit was working too hard and therefore hurting, it may well be one of the desired effects that we want to change the force uh, or change the, the relative strength of different muscles. OK, doesn't pull your foot down. All right. So we can't yank your toes onto the ground or we can't um, pull something closer with it. It can only push up. All right. It's not aiming to roll your foot out. Very often when you first stand on a pair of orthotic insoles, you'll feel like you're rolling out because you're so used to rolling in. All right. So 80% or so of the orthotics which are prescribed are generally for rolling in type problems, often termed pronation. Um, but I'd say in my clinic, it's probably about 50-50. We see a lot of the people for insoles who, who haven't been able to be sorted out in other places. So 80% of orthotics prescribed generally of that rolling in sort of thing. Although for some people, their problem is they can't roll in enough. Got to be a bit of a uh, bit of both. All right. yeah, a lot of people um, think that they're just there to, to stop pronation and to limit range of pronation, but sometimes you actually need to generate that pronation force as well for, for people with other. Yeah, we've got to, we've got to allow that foot to, yes. to, because pronation, we're, we're, again, we'll go through that in a little bit more in a second and they're, they're not going to make you dependent on the insole okay so your muscles and ligaments and things will adapt around the shape that the insole allows your foot to, to um, progress over and your muscles will learn that shape so I often say to patients and this isn't for everybody 
but for most people they can probably get away with using them like reading glasses after they've had them for six months so when you first start wearing them it's changing things but after that it's a nudge okay so you can generally often get away with them for a bit less of the time um, the longer you've had them for okay so I thought it would be useful to go through what a foot is actually doing on the ground okay during it during a step so that we can contextualize what an orthotic is actually trying to achieve. So when we hit the ground, we tend to hit, hit the ground on the outside back of our heel. All right, so we swing a leg out in front of us, straighten our knee, pull our toes up so we don't smack the ground with them, and we hit, the, hit that ground with the outside border of our heel bone. So if you're running, that might be midfoot or even forefoot, but it's generally the outside section that you're hitting it with. So at this point, all of your body weight is coming down the inside of your ankle, whereas the ground is hitting you on the outside. So that should cause your foot to roll in. That horrendous word pronation that we always get told is a bad thing, we must have that pronation occurring. It's got to roll in. So that's your body adapted, that's your body, sorry, um, sort of taking those impact forces. So next bit is called the load response. So your foot flattening. Sorry, so the, the pronation we talk, talk about is just a movement of the foot. Yeah. In the same way that the elbow bends, well, flexes and extends, the foot, foot pronates and supinates. It's just a, a normal movement. That we're normal, healthy movement to occur. And if we, um, yeah, you need, you need some degree of pronation in, in order to do certain things on the, on the ground. And you don't have a pronated or a supinated foot. Pronation is the movement that gets you to a flat foot or gets you out of a flat foot. So supination gets you out of it, pronation gets you into it. So um, after we've initially touched the ground with our foot, our body weight's still accelerating onto the ground as you lower that foot towards the ground. So you're still going through a pronatory movement at that point. And then once you've got your foot flat on the ground, you then start to swing your shin bone over the top. So at this point, your foot is still rolling in. Okay, so from, can I get my mouse back at this one? No. So from initial contact, low, low response to having your foot flat on the ground, you're, and then swinging your shin bone until it's about vertical above your ankle, all of that time you are doing a pronatory movement okay the act of pronation lower brings the ankle joints and the joints in the middle part of the foot closer to the ground lowering your arch profile okay once your shin has passed and you start to lift your weight onto the ball of your foot you start to resupinate so you roll back out of that um, pronated position your arch starts to rise up again and your foot begins to re-stiffen. So we're basically in the first two thirds of the step, half, a, half to two thirds of the step, we're taking those impact forces, turning your foot into a floppier thing and allowing it to adapt to the ground surface. As you swing your body weight past, we start to roll the foot back out again, re-stiffen the foot and allow you something stiff to push off. All right, so all of that, has to occur in 0.4 to 0.6 of a second, all right? And you do that eight to 10,000 times a day, 365 days a year, times however many years you've been alive. So for Andrew, 25, <laughs> okay? And then we do that over and over and over again. Now imagine that's got to allow your foot to adapt for whatever the ground surface is, however heavy you are, whether you're carrying a bag with you, whether there's a hill, Okay, whether you even saw the ground. So that's, that's an automatic system that just happens as an emergent property of what the bones are doing. Held together by the ligaments, powered by the muscles. And then we've got a swing phase, which we're not that interested in for the purpose of this. We're, we're, we're only really having an effect with the insole at the, at, the sw at the stance phase. Okay, so when you're actually planting your foot and rolling it across the ground. And Ian, we've, just got, we've just got a question uh, come in from uh, uh, Katrina Corby. Um, if the foot is fatigued from a poor posture, the orthotic would help encourage better posture 
and intrinsic as well as extrinsic muscles would transmit energy more efficiently. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, that, I think that sounds fair. I think if you're, so if we, we, we certainly get patients who are fine walking a certain distance and if they walk double that distance, then they start to get a problem. And to take it to extreme, you get uh, uh, Ironman triathletes who don't get any pain until they've been running for two and a half hours. You know, so fatigue and uh, of the muscles ability and the, the soft tissues ability to um, adapt for the, that bony structure against the ground is definitely going to, um, can be augmented with an orthotic. We're also going back to the sensory feedback thing where hopefully we're going we're gonna to be able to feel the ground a bit better um, as we get fatigue in that, that neuromuscular um, patterning. So um, yeah, in short, yes. Sounds good. Not good at a short answer. <laughs> right, so <laughs> what, what can an orthotic actually do? So uh, an orthotic, we, we find it can decelerate and accelerate movement. All right, so it can basically, if we think of the foot as a, and here's the live, live version of the one we just saw, if we think of a foot as a flowing system of movements over the ground, all right, and that is taking time to get from one bit to the next, to the next, to the next, and your body's moving over the top of that. If we can, with an insole, slow a bit down or speed another bit up, then we can alter the way that next bone flows. So if we think of it as, as a sequence of movements rolling, flowing across the ground, if we can alter one, the time that one bit occurs, the next bit doesn't have to work as hard and then so forth and so forth, all right? Um, it can limit the range of that pronatory movement, okay? So if you're pr still pronating when your body needs you to be supinating, so if you're still rolling in when you should be rolling out, then we might be able to limit how far you roll in and help you come back out of that. So we did you trying to say there's, in, it's trying to make the foot resupinate earlier than it was doing before yeah well it certainly it won't it may not sorry the foot may not get to the same degree of pronation it did before so it hasn't got to prone resupinate as far all right i think we can we can show that whether we can actually make it supinate is a is another question so i think your foot's often supinated this is a big and again another bigger topic but a lot of the things that supinate you are actually outside the foot's control uh, whereas the things that pronate you are very much foot ground uh, in the face so we know that the insole will what we what we want an insole to do is bend a bit okay and we might want to make it stiffer in one bit and bend bendier in another so as you roll your foot across the ground you get deformation at one bit, stiffness at another bit, so you can, we can retime when that's occurring. Okay, so it's resisting the push down, okay, and it's changing the direction of the forces between the ground and you. So if your body weight's coming down at this angle and we curve, uh, curve a bit up, we can change the ground from hitting you that way to hitting you that way, all right? So we can re-angle where that where the where the two forces interface and if that's the bit that hurts we can offload it and send it somewhere else okay now breaking news insoles can't make you lighter all right and they can't change gravity so you've still got to deal with hitting the ground and ground hitting you back we can just re-angle where that's going all right so uh, and it might be able to so this is a, a more emerging bit that we're showing that the foot is more and more sensitive than we thought it was, shall we say. And the insole, by putting different textures on it, so this one's quite grippy, um, by putting different shapes and contours, lumps and things on it, we may well be able to interfere with, or interfere with, alter the way the nerves and muscles are interacting with each other uh, to play with that variable. So, the tissue that's injured, sorry, we, we as clinicians tend to talk about tissues rather than hurty bits, but for the hurty bit, for whatever has become uh, the hurty tissue, okay, we can re reduce the elongation of it so we can stop it needing to pull so hard. So for the, for the people who managed to catch uh, Andrew and Nick's talk last Thursday, was it your talk? 
it's, yeah, it's still, yeah. still still live. Yeah, it's, it's still right. So um, what we're looking to do is modify the load on that tissue. So the the tendon. I think we talked about posterior tibial tendon um, last week. So that this is a tendon that runs down the inside of the ankle here and is a primary decelerator of that pronation. So it pulls, it's like a rope pulling that way while you're rolling in. So if that's worked really hard because you've done a sprint session or something and you've managed to injure it because you hadn't done enough building up to that sprint session, you can use an insole to reduce that stress. All right, now when you've recovered it, do you need the insole still? Depends if you're gonna train responsibly. Um, Okay, so it can modify the load through bits of the tendon and it can put them back in their sweet spot. All right, so if you've got a bit that you've stretched too much and it's hurt, it can stop it needing to stretch as much so you can do more of your sporting activities. If we just go back to the, the zone of optimum stress, just to... yeah, I know it's one of your faves. I, I, yeah. I was trying to get off it quickly. So it's, uh, yeah, I think a lot of podiatrists will probably understand what the zone of optimum stress is, but we've got a lot of. Uh, non-podiatrists watching as well so that the zone of optimum stress is like this the amount of like if, if we go over the zone of optimum stress we start putting too much stress on a tissue more than it's able to cope with and that's when we start getting injuries if we go under the zone of optimum stress then we're not stressing the body enough to stimulate it to, to stay strong and the body starts getting it st starts atrophying or get getting weaker as a result of not having enough stress. So at one end of the spectrum, we've got too much stress, which gets the body uh, injured through through too much stress. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got not enough stress on the body, making the body weaker. But there's a, a sweet spot in the middle where we, we if, if we can train in that area, then it allows enough stress to stimulate the body to get stronger, um, but not too much that it gets injured and not too little that it Get, gets weaker it's that that sweet spot and that's what we're we're always trying to to aim for so that's very cool yeah. and so if, if you are a, if you are an, uh, a sports person what an insole might be is a shortcut and a cheat to get back to doing some of your fizz quicker um uh, and uh, without necessarily having to do all of the rehab and then you can rehab yourself out of the insole all right so there's a massive danger there because if you put the insole in and it makes it all feel better do people or are you going to continue doing your stretches exercises and rehab i'll leave that one hanging absolutely <laughs> so uh so tendons particularly this this is often uh, tendon research there's more of it than than other other types of uh, tissue but basically if you as andrew was just saying if you keep overloading a tendon it will just keep failing all right um it allows tissue repair. So basically we're giving your immune system a response, uh, uh, help by taking some of the load out of the situation. We're letting your body heal itself um, a bit more easily. So it's an active rest, all right? As uh, uh, in my army PTI days, we used to call it active rest when they were only sweating and dying a little bit. Um, it allows you to do rehabilitation with less pain. So a lot, of the, a lot of the thinking at the moment appears to be that it's okay to be in a bit of pain when you're doing your rehab. I don't know if Andy would agree with that, yeah. but most yeah. of the time, some of them even, some of the, some of the papers appear to even encourage it, all right? Yeah. But yeah, it allows you to be in less pain, perhaps, uh, when, you're, when you're doing the rehab. So therefore it lets you get back, back to your activities, whether they, they be uh, playing high level football or walking your dog. Whichever one is the one that's hurting you is what we want to get you back to doing. Yeah, right. yeah. So as far as saying that people do need to have a bit of pain for, for rehab to occur, that's where we start building up the resilience and the, the tolerance. So yeah, I think yeah, pain is not necessarily a bad thing. You do need a, a bit of it, definitely. Yeah, I think pa sometimes pain is just a signal there's something wrong. And if you know there's something wrong, how do you address the pain? So. I think Andrew's going to do a little bit more talk on this one as I press some buttons. But so one of the questions that has come up in the, in the lead up to, to doing this webinar, uh, when, when are orthotics temporary? When are they permanent? All right. And that seems to be a, a common sort of question. Some people put them in and love them. Some people can't wait to stop wearing them. So um, some of the thoughts behind when it might be temporary or permanent. All right. So, um, it might be temporary if we just need to reduce the injury to a particular bit. 
all right so take my scenario of the your you come out of your winter running training and you go straight into doing intervals and hill reps and your ankle muscles weren't ready for that all right because it's a fairly different activity to suddenly sprint up a hill to doing your long slow miles over the winter uh, so you can use insoles as a temporary measure to help reduce the stress on that injured bit while you do your rehab and then you do your prehab and then you wean yourself off the uh, insole. This is going know. back to the Zeus zone, isn't it? If somebody's gone over the limit, they've gone into the, the danger zone, that the orthotic is there to bring them back into that, that Zeus area to take the load off. Well, I've got that as a specific yeah. one in a second. Okay. Yeah. So possibly give you more sensory feedback and it gives you, um, gets you back into that zone of optimal stress. So gives us back, gets you back into your sweet spot so you can then keep doing your sporting activity or, or get, you know, I get as many people when you really find out why they've come, it's because their dog's getting fat. It's not because their ankle or knee or something hurts. It's because they're not able to walk their dog their dog's getting fat, they're feeling guilty about that, they've had to take it to the vets two extra times. So that's the actual motivator for coming in, not necessarily the pain. So if we can get you back doing those sorts of activities, there's going to be a much better, better result for you. Uh, so it allows a better tissue adaptive response. All right. So if we need to rebalance the muscles and the activity of things around the foot, ankles, toes, uh, things like that they're actually quite hard to rehab compared to an arm or a, or a thigh or something like that so it's it's a, it's an easy win to stick an appropriately shaped bent bit of plastic in all right and then you haven't got to worry about it it's happening for you um, if somebody has a weight to surface area issue in relation to their foot all right so if you're 90 odd kilos and you've got a size three foot the soft tissue that's trying to control the way that foot is moving would need to be ridiculously strong to be able to do it. So you can use an insole as a, to increase the surface area as a short term measure will hopefully address the other bits. Yeah. A high BMI doesn't necessarily mean somebody with a, a high uh, fat percentage. It can be muscle as well. If somebody's yeah. very muscle on top, then they're, they're nice of you to say. Uh, but yeah, big, big rugby players again to take the first scenario of someone because a lot of the time if you're a big, um, big fella doing that, playing, playing a lot of rugby, big, doing your weight training and then suddenly you go into new season training, if you've not done appropriate build up for that, it's a lot of power and suddenly you're in a scrum pushing against it. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of load going through tendons and things that it wasn't necessarily trained for. So, permanent. Uh, is generally when you can't get rid of the underlying problem. So if something's become arthritic and it won't move now, you're not going to be able to just rehab that. All right, you're not going to be, you've got to find a way of offloading it, changing the stress, changing the forces, things like that. So whether that's arthritic knees or big toes, things like that, sometimes post-surgery. Um, as with this insole, this is a bespoke one, but you'll see it's got some funky sort of shapes and cut things around here. So this person's got a, a, a lump bit, lumpy bit basically sticking out of the bottom of their arch. So we need to provide some offloading for that, some cushioning and then some deformity um, so that they can basically spring back through their foot without having to press that bit on the ground. So that insole is likely to be a permanent change. Now, when I'm saying older people, I mean quite a lot older, you know, not, not my age. Um, so we're looking at where it's, it's very hard to do enough rehab to cause that adaptive change in a long, long enough term to, to address their, their underlying sort of uh, structure and mechanic. Sometimes people don't do all the exercises that they perhaps need to, or life doesn't allow them to. So insoles are a way of essentially cheating for that sometimes so i think andrew had some comments about these these bits he says yeah yeah I'll see, I, can, can you see my cursor moving is that possible no it's not it's not allowing no, that's all right that's fine so yeah with because most of my patients i see are, are runners so most of the injuries that we see are running related rather than um, arthritis related so when we're using orthotics alongside a a rehab program because we're using 
but with rehab we're using exercises to start building people's strength and get them back to running we, we can use orthotics to sort of get people back to the the sports and activities that they enjoy doing um, and that, that allows their tissues to, to stay stronger for that sport because the, the body only adapts to the forces that are applied to it so the only thing that's going to get you fit for for running is running am i making sense yeah uh, I, I, I like it yeah and if you're playing uh football or rugby or some, something something like that then if the, the orthotic allows you to carry out that activity then you also keep that that skill level up as well which which we can't do with with uh, gym based um exercises so the orthotics allow you to carry out the activity that you're doing but we still need to probably to a, to a lower lower level than you could before you get get injured um, but we still need to, to continue doing the gym work to build up the, the strength in the tissues to get you back to to full full strength it makes you quite popular as a practitioner no no runner has ever been enjoyed being told not to run no no so, so if, you, if we can find uh, ways of helping people run then that's uh, that's quite quite useful yeah. um Actually, if you I, a dog I, walker as well if you sorry especially if you're a dog walker as well if you've got a dog telling you that you need to go out for a longer walk then yeah, yeah. there's no option it's a, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It, this is where these sorts of things can because sometimes you can't um rehab it quickly enough for the amount of activity you want to do yeah so you've and you know holidays are another one i, I don't know about your case slide uh, andrew but i certainly get quite a lot of people who are suddenly in emergency when holidays come in Absolutely. yeah uh, yeah so yeah, yeah and then they want to wear sandals and flip-flops yeah. and you know it's uh, it's not that they're those are good or bad footwear in themselves but if you've got an injury it's harder to control that type of footwear um with a with the an insole so uh, sorry with, with just the people are, when they're using the insoles for that that reason is that they're they're doing the the, the exercise and the strengthening rehab stuff alongside it as well so the, the orthotic isn't um, a treat it is a treatment but it's not the treatment package the treatment package is the orthotic plus rehab yeah, as well. yeah, yeah it's, it's sometimes quite a hard yeah, conversation yeah. to have people so i think there's a there's a, an idea that insoles are just a standalone thing that you uh see, that was a pun i wasn't even intending uh but a, a thing that you just <laughs> stick in your shoes and that's all you have to do um so and that perhaps there are some cases where that's the case but uh, very often or nearly always there's there's other things that need to be done alongside that so uh, it brings us on to what's the best type of insole and unfortunately the answer is whatever the one the best one is for you so it doesn't an off-the-shelf insole is not more or less good for you than a semi-bespoke or a modular or a bespoke or custom all right the the clinician will select the appropriate type of insole for you for your condition and for your your requirements and sometimes it's you know your footwear requirements might mean you have to have a custom one built when you could have worn an off-the-shelf one but you're never going to fit that in your shoe so when the, one of the things we can do with the custom ones is we can do fancy angling and uh, uh, and bits of bits in the creation of them which take less space than if you've got to build it out of layering material up all right so sometimes it's actually the footwear choices you have which require you to need a custom one rather than a semi-bespoke or a, or a, an off-the-shelf one so um but yeah where where possible um yeah we find the right the right one and you might move between those you know, you might need a custom one to start with and then go for an off-the-shelf one as you're weaning yourself off and getting stronger so there are different ways of approaching the uh, and using it in conjunction with other other treatment modalities so a lot of the work i do is actually referrals in we do insoles as part of their treatment plan write reports and then um send them back so you know we're we're, we're sitting in there like we I, when people ask what we do it's basically we're here when nothing else has worked that's when people come it's not we're often not your first choice but when the mri scan has said nothing's wrong You've been to see somebody else for a while you've tried resting it for about a week uh got fed up of resting it went for a run anyway uh and then you decided rest doesn't work that's when people end up sort of uh, coming along the lines of insoles and when they're not appropriate it's quite disappointing sometimes for people 
So I'm afraid I disappoint as many people by saying, no, I'm afraid you don't need one. Yeah, I think it's trying to work out to what sort of level you're going, what, what effect you're going to get from them as well. If, if you're only going to get a very small gain from them, then there's really not much point spending spending the money on, on them. If, well, I think, again, that's that's a decision, yeah, to be made between the the, the person and you know it's a discussion, isn't it? Yeah, so absolutely. you can't, yeah. You know, so it's the yeah. It depends what their their outcomes and goals are. You know, if if you can't play with your grandkids because your uh, um, your toe hurts, and yeah, you probably could spend three months rehabbing it, but or wear this insole now and play the grandkids this week. It's a it's a it's an interesting conversation sometimes to have. Because you know it's not necessarily a permanent or required thing, but sometimes it's what you need to get to where you want to be in the time frame that you've got. So uh, I have got the references, or you know, basically bibliography there of a lot of the things I drew that from. We can put that back up at the end. But uh, I'll un. How do I can share? Oh, okay. There we go. Do we yeah, so okay. that was the that was the slide bit. I've just got one more slide for for at the end. But I don't know if we've had any questions. I know I had one leading up to this. Uh, we haven't. No, we've got we've had a yeah. We've got sixty people watching at the moment. Uh, so hello to uh, I'd say hello to a few people. Tom Fox, Lee Murphy, uh, Robert Isaacs, Toby, Andrew Hill. Hello to to you all. Uh, so hope you hope you. Get, getting something out of this. Um, if you've got I'm, any I'm questions. I'm not angry is one of the things I'm hoping you're not getting. Uh, yeah. so, but the, so the, a question that had come in, um, someone messaged me when, we, when I sort of uh, put this on my Facebook uh, page was basically a lot of people go, and I think you covered this um, maybe a little bit with the, when you were talking about running trainers, but a lot of the time people are told, oh, you don't need your insole, you don't need your insoles because you've got we're going to give you a supportive running trainer. And unfortunately, the answer to that is there are so many reasons that you could have been given that insole. It may not be just to limit the, you know, try and limit a pronatory movement. Uh, it's, it couldn't be said that you can just swap an insole function for a trainer function. So I know we, that, you, that you guys discussed the difference. So if you, if you want to know about trainers, go back and look at that one. Um, but yeah, if, if you just get told to just take your insoles out and put, them, put these trainers in, I would, my approach would be to buy the trainers, take them back to the person who gave you the insoles. Conversation, because what, don't wear the trainer and you can, you can always take it back. All right, because some insoles can be replaced with the function of a supportive trainer and more can't. So I'd probably, you know, the old 80-20 rule, I haven't got statistics to back that up. But, you know, lots of reasons that you might be being given an insole aren't what the trainer is trying to do. Yeah, so we've just had a, a question uh, from now Wafer. Uh, thoughts on kids and developmental mechanics and orthotic therapy? Small topic. Uh, so uh, I think my my approach to children is I only I only really do anything if they're in pain. So we're we're not necessarily going to do anything um, apart from I think they call it watchful waiting. So we would generally keep an eye on them every three months, every six months, or a growth uh, if they've gone through two shoe sizes change quickly. Um, I very seldom do custom ones uh, for for children. Um, I. I'm unaware of anything that says that they stunt or change the development of the child. So if, the, if you're genetically going to grow one way, sticking a bent bit of plastic in the shoe is unlikely to alter that. So, yeah, I suppose they're my thoughts. Have you got anything additional yeah, to that? I think it's your, your DNA determines um, what sort of shape your, your bones are going to, to grow out, along with nutrition, of course. If, you, uh, if you've got poor, poor nutrition, that's going to affect things. Um, but, yeah, I don't think we can change the the shape of children's bones with with orthotics so yeah it's not something i'm yeah no, I, I, it's yeah. not something that we would be uh, yeah it would be yeah I, i've never seen anything that that says we can although i re i realize it seems to be a fear out there so i think it perhaps comes from the idea that an orthotic is a splint so therefore if you're splinting someone's something then you might well change the way the bones grow but you know my understanding is that the foot and therefore body 
roll over the top of the orthotic and the orthotic just changes the direction of the force in some way. Uh, so it's an interactive. I prefer the term, if I was allowed to use a longer term, I would like to call insoles uh, or orthotic insoles a tailored piece of ground to walk on. So what we've done is tried to create you the best, the optimal piece of ground to walk on for the duration that you require the insole for. Yeah, and I think if they're going to allow kids to run, jump and play and do what they do, then that's going to keep the body strong and developing how, how it should be. So we've got another question uh, from Alfred Strong. Will orthotics offload problems around corns, um, e.g. on top of toes? Um, probably not on top of toes. It's, it depends. So if the, if the digit is, well, promote, well, corns are a little bit outside my world, but all, all corns are caused by pressure and friction, or most corns are caused by pressure and friction. So ones on top of the toes, by, by definition, have to be rubbing on your shoe somehow. So probably more often, sticking an insole in is going to take up space. So if your shoe is already too small in some way or you're or not the right shape for the front of your foot and you're rubbing on it, if you stick an insole in as well, then it's probably going to um, actually take space up. So it might make the situation worse. However, if you can adapt, if the, if the digits are retractable, so if they're, if they're not arthritically in that kind of position and they're, they're mobile, by changing the, the, the flow of the bones and things across the ground, you may allow the soft tissue to adapt and change over time, which could allow the toes to straighten out. So, but that's a long-term hope rather than a short-term effect on your corns. Yeah, certainly with corns we found on the, the bottom of the foot, so up underneath the, the toes, then yeah, we can do quite a lot with um, insoles to, to help get, get rid of those. But yeah, the, the, the insole only really works from a, uh, by, by redistributing pressure underneath the foot. So yeah, on top of toes, I don't think it's going to be... It can, it can push up, it can't pull down, yeah. unfortunately. Well, and yeah. So, yeah, it's, got to, it, it's doing a small, it's doing a little nudge thousands of times. So it's not, it's, you can off, certainly offload corns in the short term, but you've, your body's still got to take time to readjust the way it's, it's developing that, that sort of uh, skin tissue under there. And again, we've still taken up space. And the deeper the hole we need to dig to, to create the, the space for that corn to not touch the ground, the thicker the insole needs to be. And the more bespoke, probably. Actually, another, we can, we can use thing, um, like silicon things that we can make called otterforms and that they're sort of like a type of orthotic that right around the yeah. toe and they, they can actually offload uh, pressure and friction off the top of the toe so yeah there are there are things that we can do for, for like long-term corns yeah. any more questions from anybody so should we just sort of sum up then what about, about orthotics, what they can do, or oh, what about improving mechanics of hallux valgus? Uh, so, yeah, when the big... If you've got a bunion. Yeah, yeah, so sort of bunion things, where this bone's sort of sticking out, then the big toes yeah. coming so back. I think you have to, the, again, a bunion is, a, is probably a, another whole web webinar for Andrew at some point. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, we, we can certainly change the forces around it. And if you have a bunion, then the likelihood is that your foot is struggling to resupinate because you can't bend tissue around that big toe very easily. So insoles might become required a secondary to that. Um, I think there's very little um, that I'm aware of which says that we can make a bunion straighter by wearing an insole, but I think we can dis uh, significantly reduce their progression if you can find the right type of insole. All right, but it's probably not going to just be an insole. Yeah, we can probably we can make that life a bit comfy, but yeah, we can't can't straighten them out. So uh, we've got a couple more. Hi, how would you determine the height of a met dome? Met domes are a tricky thing. So met, um, I think met met domes positioning as well as height is quite a tricky thing, and getting it repeatably in the same place every time is also quite a tricky thing. They generally need to sit a little bit further back than you intuitively want them. So when you first put them in, you usually think they're a little bit further back than they're usually a bit more 
bit, yeah, a bit further back than you think. Um, in terms of determining the height, I suppose it's probably educated guess. I don't know if Andrew's got a uh, more sophisticated yeah, bit. Um, yeah, I must admit for, for Met Domes, they are, they are tricky, but um, with a Met Dome, it's a, uh, I can't, I've not got an insole here to try and demonstrate what a Met Dome is, but usually I get people into the clinic. Um, so it's a, it's a lump here. All right, so if you've, if you've had a pair of um, uh, Birkenstocks or something, they'll have a Met Dome in them. So it, metatarsals, it's a dome that basically pushes up or, or raises the, the metatarsals before they hit the ground, takes a bit of pressure yeah, out of it. It's just pushing Maybe. up this part of the, the foot. Yeah. yeah, it's pushing up there rather than in the, in the arch. So yeah, I generally get people into the clinic and then we, we stick the Met Dome in place whilst they're, they're there rather than trying to to do it in the, the actual making process of the, the orthotic and then, then we stick the top cover down afterwards yeah, when we I'll often, I'll often test to see if they're going to work before making them a permanent feature yeah um, because yeah. they're of, of all the things you ever put on an insole they tend to be the, the least popular it's yeah. a it's a yeah. lumpy bit it feels like a stone in shoe because essentially we've stuck a stone in the shoe it's just you know we did it on purpose so it's there it takes a little bit of getting used to often so um, we've got another question. Uh, my 13 year old has worn orthotics for years. He has very flat feet. Should we get rid of them if they're not changing anything? I think that's probably quite a broad question because the, what, what is the change you're hoping to see? Uh, so again, it would be a conversation with the clinician who's issued the insole as to what the aim of them is, um, what you're, what you're hoping to achieve from them. And if, change yeah you've got to define what you mean by change for for that but um if it's not it's it's unlikely to spontaneously give them an arch uh if that's what you're hoping for um but you know why do you if it's still helping it's not um yeah the, what was the reason they started wearing them in the first place if it was just because they had flat feet but no problems that might not be an indication for having them but if they've um we're getting pains and symptoms that return when you take the insole away then that would be an indication for continuing to use it yeah yeah i think that's a, a fair enough answer so yeah a lot of people saying thank you uh Irene rollins lucy godfrey thank you very much glad you glad you enjoyed it and claire as well thank, thank you very much for for coming along and i hope you've hope you've got some, some something out of this uh, i think we're going to it has been an hour. Yeah, wrap, wrap it up now unless there's any, any more questions come through in the, the next couple of seconds. Yeah, we've got, we've got a few second lag. You're going to have missed them. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline Davidson. So, yeah, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there then and, and call that a day. Okay. So, do you want to just share the details of that? Yeah, yeah, if you want to pop up your, your last one there. Uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to, to get in touch with Ian, he's based down in Norwich, we're, we're down with Alan Partridge. Um, so, yeah, this is his, uh -huh. there's really? his want to, to get in touch. So, yeah, we're, we're on all of the, all of the usual um, uh, contact media. Uh, so, email our reception at, there's Instagrams to follow, Facebooks to follow, websites, and we also run um, some courses on actually prescribing orthotics. So, uh, if you wanted to check out any of those, obviously you can always send us a, a message or contact us via Andrew as well. But uh, I think we've uh, it's remarkable to actually do it in an hour. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay then. Thank you everyone for coming, and thank you Ian as well for for coming along. It's been a been a great help. So we'll say yeah, yeah. yeah goodbye to you all. <laughs>